It's a great pleasure to be back at DLD um, for this session on designing semi-living products. And uh, this is really the second in a, in a series of conversations. Um, Steffi uh, mentioned that uh, I am uh, leading the project to develop a new life sciences museum and forum for Munich and for Bavaria, which will be at the wonderful location of Schloss Nymphenburg. Have any of you been to Schloss Nymphenburg? Okay, that's, uh, that's good. So um, we hope that you will come back to experience uh, a new vision of what life sciences can be. And um, Craig Venter has described the 21st century as the biological century. So what, what could a museum for that century look like? Um, well, the first, century, uh, the first conversation that we had was back in January. We had Paola Antonelli of MoMA, and we had Daisy Ginsberg, uh, founder of Synthetic Aesthetics and, uh, from the Royal College of Art in London, uh, exploring uh, uh, design and life sciences. Um, and uh, today, we have two leading lights, two, two of the people who inspire me the most uh, in the world uh, around uh, manipulating life in creative ways. And these are Oron Katz, who is the founder of Symbiotica in the University of Western Australia, which is an extraordinary uh, program where artists and designers get to work with biological materials uh, in laboratory settings. And we'll hear a lot more about that in a moment from Oron. Uh, and then we will be joined in our panel by Ellen Jorgensen, co-founder of Genspace uh, in Brooklyn, uh, which is a, another extraordinary uh, space uh, which uh, invites people and the public in to do DIY uh, biology and uh, to uh, get their hands on the new tools that are available to us, including CRISPR, which we have been hearing about from Ellen in her CRISPR workshop just now. Um, so I, we see these conversations as a way of seeding the ideas for this new museum in Nymphenburg. How can we uh, create a new way for people to connect with life sciences, to con connect with the key environmental issues for our time? Uh, how can we create a new place where people will come to discuss our concerns and opportunities around uh, new technologies allowing us to manipulate life? Um, so I would like to first of all introduce Oren Katz uh, to tell us what is a semi-living product? So, Oren, over to you. Thanks. Thanks. Th thanks, Michael. John, it's great to be here. And uh, just to put in context, I just arrived very early this morning from Stockholm, uh, where I was involved in a very critical cultural theory conference. So I'm just trying to adjust. It's worse than being in a jet lag. It's actually uh, mindsets that uh, we need to get our heads around. Um, so where are we now? What are we dealing with? Uh, we're dealing with a really interesting situation, and I think today you heard quite a lot of things that can come together in this idea that technology is becoming more lifelike. Uh, you think about uh, driverless cars or killer drones. We, we give technology the autonomy to make decisions of life and death at the very same time that we are trying to assert our control over already existing autonomous systems, and those are living systems. So what does it mean to do those kind of things? What does it mean to work with technology, which on the one hand makes, becomes more and more like life, and making life more and more like technology? Those are questions that I've been asking myself for at least 20 years now. So I was studying design in the early 90s, and I came across with this image. How many of you remember seeing it for the first time? Yeah. How many of you have seen it just now for the first time? Really? Well, 20 years ago, actually 20 years and uh, nine months ago exactly, in a BBC documentary, this image appeared on the television screens. This is, for me, the surrealist dream comes alive, but it also presented something which is really interesting, and that's our ability, or at least our mindset, of our ability to try and control living systems to such an extent that we can bring those things, those monsters, to life. That was a scientific project that was representing a technology that was just starting at the time called tissue engineering. And tissue engineering as a mindset is a really important shift in the way we're thinking about bodies and biology and technology. So this slide over here, it's actually from 1989. That's how we imagined we're going to repair our bodies. Yeah, so very hard dry, 
mechanical engineering type of approach to replace bit by bit the body with machines. 10 years later, 1999, everything changed. Suddenly, there was this understanding that we might, in one day in the future, be able to harness those latent regenerative powers of our bodies to regrow body spare parts. Now, interesting enough, the kind of discussion that we heard 20 years ago is almost identical to the kind of discussion that we hear now with the same timescales of when things are going to happen. So in 1995, an international consortium of scientists set up on an initiative to try and grow a heart, a fully functional heart, outside of the body, and they gave themselves 10 years to do it. We obviously, 20 years later, we're not even close to do it, but as a mindset, as an understanding of how we're going to look at living biological systems, it was a really important moment. Now, for me as a designer, I was actually really interested in reversing the logic. Yeah? So if in 1989 we were told that we can replace the heart with a pump, in 1999 or in 1995 we were told we can actually grow hearts, my question was why not grow pumps? Why not use this technology of tissue engineering, and this is how it was at the very beginning, where you basically start with a three-dimensional scaffold of the desired shape of the organ you're trying to replace, you seed it with appropriate cells, you grow it in vitro, you grow it outside of the body for a while, and then you put it into the body. So my thing was, forget about putting it back into the body. How about designing living biological systems that are functional, that can operate outside of the body in the same way that, let's say, the pump can operate? As I was researching it, I was writing my thesis, which was about this, basically, a speculative design project looking at the future in which bio, uh, design and biotechnology might come together. Uh, at the time, I was uh, basically trying to figure out what was the best of the technology, and that was growing skin for burn patients. I was actually looking at uh, many different alternatives of growing surfaces, things like uh, bacterial cellulose and biomats. I was even trying to imagine if we can engineer and, uh, plants to basically grow huge leaves so we can actually cover our domestic environment with something which is living, because for me, I was thinking maybe if we change our culture from manufacturing to growing and make our domestic products and our objects and the made environment more like a forest, more like a garden, maybe it, we would solve some problems. But at the very same time, I realized that there might be a flip side for that. And the flip side is if we're starting to treat life as a raw material, something to be engineered, maybe we would lose this kind of connection to life. Now, being a materialist, it's something that bothered me because I felt that there's a special place for life, but I couldn't really articulate it without resorting to metaphysical ideas, and the last 20 years of my life are devoted to this exploration. Is there something special about life? What happens when life becomes a raw material to be engineered? And I developed this project called the Tissue Culture and Art Project because I actually realized that those questions are better be asked by an artist rather than a designer. I was interested in actually looking at the problems and the questions rather than the solutions that might come in the future. So I started by growing skin with my collaborator in Azur over a different class, type of glass figurines. At the time, I couldn't even imagine that I'll be able to get what I'm growing in the lab because actually I knocked on the door of a scientist and surprisingly she got me into the lab and I started working with issue engineering as a designer and as an artist. Uh, but I only thought that I could kind of represent it in different ways, and those were the very early works, which might be seductive, but they didn't really work for me very well. And then in the year 2000, United and myself were invited to be research fellows in Harvard Medical School, where we started to work with the top technologies of tissue engineering, and we started to develop tissue-engineered sculptures, or as we started to refer to them, semi-living products and semi-living sculptures. So the very first semi-living sculptures that we were able to present live in a cultural context where our semi-living warrior dolls, we set up a fully functioning uh, laboratory at the foyer of the Bruckner House in Linz as part of Ars Electronica, where we grown those tiny dolls, and we asked people to express those worries to the dolls. So they were made out of living tissue, and they were growing live in the gallery as a way to try and induce people to express their concerns uh, around the future of life. What we didn't realize is that people actually projected those uh, uh, magical powers, and people actually express the most intimate worries and concerns. So the next project we've done was looking at those unfulfilled promises and the hype, and actually now we find ourselves in a really similar situation where the hype cycle of biotechnology takes us to such places that we actually believe 
that pigs could fly one day. So we decided to see what shape those wings would take of the flying pigs, and we looked at the evolutionary solution of flight invertebrates, so the bats, the birds, and the pteridoxals, and the iconography of those wings. Yeah? So bat, with, bat wings are usually attached to devils and demons, bird wings are attached to angels, and the pteridoxal wings are not really attached to anything because we just found out about them late in our history. And in a sense, that can be kind of ways in which we can think about our relationship to biotechnology. We can think it's going to destroy us, we can think it's going to save us, or we can say, just wait a moment, we need to figure out what's going on here. And interesting enough, that was also the first project that we introduced 3D printing techniques to the lab in Harvard to 3D print those wings and then make them out of the polymer and grow them in bioreactors uh, in three dimensions. And actually, at the time, there were some of the biggest tissue-engineered constructs ever to be grown in the lab, but they were still very small. And when people would come to the gallery, they would imagine that they were going to see, if not flying pigs, at least wings which are big enough for the pigs to, grow, to fly with. And they would see those tiny objects in those cheap jewelry boxes and get quite disappointed, which is OK. We then moved to uh, what we refer to as a pseudo-utilitarian project. And we started to figure out what we can do with tissue engineering in this realm. Uh, so we started to grow meat. And the first piece of meat that we grown was back in the year 2000. This is like a lovely piece of meat uh, made out of uh, prenatal lamb muscle cells that we grown in those bioreactors for about three months. Uh, but because we didn't have the license to grow meat, we couldn't eat it at the time. And we first ate our steaks in 2003. But that would give you some information. Can we get the volume, please, on the video? In Perth, a strange creation is slowly growing in a lab. Oren Katz works in the Biological Sciences Department. He's making some of the world's first artificial meat. When we grow those cells, uh, we actually tend to refer to them in the term semi-living, because they're not fully alive, they're not an animal, but they are a living part of an animal uh, sustained in an artificial environment. This artificial meat was grown from the muscle cells of a lamb, but they could have been cells from any animal. The cells were cultured in a nutrient solution made up of blood plasma derived from cattle. The muscle cell cultures are grown in a microgravity bioreactor, which constantly rotates the meat so it grows in three dimensions. Without this motion, the meat would be flat, only a few cells thick. But there's another problem to overcome if the lab-grown meat is ever to mimic the real thing. There is research which is being taken place at the moment in trying to find ways in which you can exercise those muscle cells so they would align and have a more of a muscle-like texture. And there's two ways that can be done. One is by electrically uh, stimulating those cells, or the second way is to try and exercise them physically, trying to build tiny exercise machines, tiny gyms for those cells uh, to grow and end. Actually, we so have we're, uh, we're not able to do it when we've done our first uh, eating experiment back in 2003. Uh, that was in an exhibition in Nantes, in France, in an art exhibition called La Art Biotech, where we were able to actually build a fully functioning lab in the gallery with a dining room with brand new equipment, so we won't contaminate it with uh, any other thing. We also went and rescued two frogs from the edible frog distributor in town, and this is kind of the first time that anyone ate a piece of in vitro meat, and that was 2003. Uh, unfortunately, the Americans decided to invade Iraq around the same time, so no one was really interested in uh, a bunch of artists uh, eating frog steaks. Now, the reason why we chose to grow frog was also because we were interested in what constitutes foul food. We knew that French people don't like the idea of engineered food very much, and most other people don't like the idea of eating frogs very much. So we combined those two things, and we created uh, semi-living frog steaks. Now, soon you will see someone trying to eat it. The problem with our meat was that the polymer we grown it on, which was like felt, didn't degrade completely. And as you heard in the video, we didn't exercise them, so the texture of the muscle cells was very much like jelly. So the sauce was really good. I was quite concerned about health and safety issues, so I asked the chef to cook it, cook it in a honey and garlic sauce, but the texture was quite horrible. 
And three out of the six people that joined us for the dinner spat those bits out, which for me as an artist was a great thing because I could collect them and show them in the follow-up exhibition called The Remains of Disembodied Cuisine, where we had a video documentation of the event plus the bits that were spat out by the people who didn't like that. And I thought that that was the end of my engagement with in vitro meat, but obviously quite a few would know that about uh, three years ago, a Dutch scientist called uh, Mark Post claimed to grow the first in vitro burger. And I had to revisit those issues and look at the future of food. So just recently in the Science Gallery in Dublin, I had this piece in collaboration with uh, Jonat again and uh, Robert Foster, where we're looking at taking those solutions to extremes. So we know about the issues around contemporary modes of meat production. We know about some of the predictions in regard to the future of protein consumption. So we're being offered the possibility of eating grown, lab-grown meat. And we're also being offered the opportunity to eat insects. So in this case, we decided to create this domestic bioreactor that creates an in vitro insect soup. Because one thing which is usually being neglected is the discussion around the fact that you need to feed the cells. And you need to feed the cells in highly nutrient solution. And in this case, this domestic product that sits on the table is being shadowed by this dark cloud of nutrients that's floating above it, uh, feeding the insect cells for the creation of this in vitro insect soup. Uh, although something else quite interesting happened to us, and this experiment got contaminated with fungi, so it ended up being a mushroom soup more than an insect soup. We then moved to leather, because obviously after you do meat, you need to deal with leather. And we grown our first in vitro leather back in 2003 and 2004, and this is some experiments that we've done around it. But we decided to present it as this tiny jacket that is grown inside this technological body. And that was uh, first shown in Perth in 2004, but then in 2008, we showed it at the uh, Design and Elastic Mind show in MoMA in New York. Uh, but at that time, we decided to use mouse embryonic stem cells rather than the usual mixture that we've done between human and mouse cells. And those cells grew so fast that they sheared off the polymer structure and started to travel around this, uh, the system and clogged it uh, to such an extent that it grew out of control and Paolo Antonelli from last year was supposed uh, basically had to turn it off halfway through the exhibition, which from, from our perspective actually generated quite a lot of interesting discussion. So those of you who know about the Design Elastic Mind know that it was a fairly optimistic show talking about the future in which designers and artists would work with scientists and technologies and would figure out a way to get us out of this mess that we're in. But the only living thing out of 250 works in the show had to be turned off halfway through the show and generate those types of headlines. <laughs> and from our perspective, that was the success of the piece. Now, 20 years later, suddenly things are changing quite a lot. So the project that I was looking at, this Im imaginary future in which design and biotechnology might come together, is actually coming together now through things like biofabricate. We're hearing more and more about this idea of biotechnological consumer products. And we have companies like Modern Meadow and others that are now trying to grow meat and leather. Modern, Modern Meadow actually received more than $20 million in venture capital money to try and grow leather and meat. And last year, there was history because I was able to eat in vitro meat for the second time. And that was the in vitro meat chips that are produced by Modern Meadow, who claim to do leather and meat better. Now, my role, and actually this is something that uh, Michael John failed to mention, I have another, work, another job. I'm a professor of contestable design at the Royal College of Arts in London. I contest things, and I contest this, because for me, those things are more of symptoms than solutions. I think this idea of trying to work with biological technologies in such a way might be more of a symptom rather than any attempt to solve any problem, and we can discuss it further in a conversation later on. Um, but another thing that I've done, and this is something that I'm doing quite a lot recently, but this is something that I started 16 years ago, is setting up laboratories for artists and designers to engage with the tools of modern biology in an agenda-free environment. When I started working as an artist and as a designer in a science lab, I constantly asked for favors. I constantly had to do things in return, and I was sick and tired of that. So I decided to set up my own laboratory, which became a research center at the University of Western Australia. We're based in the biological science department, but we have full autonomy to do our artistic and design research. And we are the people who drive the agenda of this research. 
And I'm now, one of the things I'm doing at the Royal College of Arts in London is trying to help them to set up a similar laboratory within an art school. Because what we're interested in are very different questions. We're interested in exploring those philosophical and questions around our shifting relationship to life. We believe that actually, first, before we can do those kind of things to life, we have to understand what the hell we're doing. We have to develop a new cultural language to engage with those new approaches to life. We, but saying that, through the move of biology from a field of science to a field of engineering, through the creation of life uh, as into a raw material to be engineered, there's also a new palette of possibilities. So we identify those new materials for artistic and design manipulation. And we research strategies of what it means to take those things out of the context of the lab and putting within a cultural context. And I think, again, this is something we'll discuss later. Uh, what does it mean to put living biological material in a museum and a gallery? Because museums are usually designed to keep dead things as dead as possible for as long as possible. What does it mean to put living things there? And we also develop our own technologies. Sometimes we have to develop our enabling technologies to allow our artistic research and our design research and ask questions which are different from those of the scientists. Now, we also offer academic programs. And we offer a Master's of Biological Arts, which in my eyes is a way more useful MBA than anything else I've seen around. So, and let me just finish with some humility as well. A couple of years ago, I got funding from the Australian government to take some Japanese artists to see the oldest rocks on Earth. This is one of the best preserved geological calendars. This goes three and a half billion years into our past. Any attempt to think that what we're doing now has any intentionality is being reduced to a humble appreciation of the fact that we are just a random mutagenic agent. Thank you. Thank you so much, Oran, and um, what an inspiring talk. Um, when you were talking about your in vitro meat project, which was uh, very early and pioneering, but uh, an artistic project, uh, it made me think about uh, Mark Post's famous uh, hamburger. I think it was a, a 250,000 euro hamburger, which uh, was, I think, Sergey Brin bought the hamburger, he like, uh, bought the world's most expensive hamburger. And um, it seems really interesting, as, and almost a thread through what you were saying, that like, some of these ideas are almost being sort of incubated or prototyped by artists, and uh, then uh, suddenly are being uh, ported into a very different dimension of commerce. And uh, how do you feel about uh, what's going on now in that realm? So, so it's really interesting, because part of my practice is to relinquish control. So the opposition that I have to the engineering mindset is the fact that I don't feel that we can control what's happening. So I can't even try and control the outcomes of my own work. And, and actually setting it out into the wild is something which is really interesting and seeing where it goes. And if it inspires people to, to make money out of it, so be it. You know? But from my perspective, for example, the, the meat wasn't ever about a commercial product, it was about our relationship to other living beings. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So when you eat something, this is the most, in most intimate relationship that you can have with other living beings. If other people want to develop a burger that uh, would be sold in McDonald's, that's a form of relationship with other living beings that they're entitled to have. Not something that I would do, but mm -hmm. they're entitled to have it. But, it, but you said in your talk that um, modern meadow, you, yep. you made the example, and you know, leather and ethical leather, ethical meat, and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, and you said that this you saw as a, a symptom yeah. rather than a solution. Yeah. Um, wh what's wrong with it? Okay, when you work in the lab, how, how many of you worked in labs, in biological labs? Y you know the amount of waste that you have, you know the amount of uh, effort that you need to put into separating the life form that you're working with from any other life form in the world. When you think about those types of issues, and when you think about upscaling biological systems, I suppose the best example we can think about is, is, is industrial farms, yeah? where we grow only cows, only in one space, they're not going to solve any environmental issue, they're actually causing more environmental issues. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to start to think about, and something we can learn from biology is actually quite interesting, now we're trying to impose a 20th century engineering mindset over biological systems, mm -hmm. but I think what we need to do is actually, rather than industrialize biology, biologize industry and start to think of, about our industry more like forests and ecosystems rather than monocultures. Yeah. 
Good. And uh, I mean, uh, some of the points you made about uh, hype around some of these new technologies also connect strongly, I think, with what Ellen was saying in her workshop on CRISPR. Uh, and you know the, the vast potentials that are envisaged for these technologies. Um, uh, do you, uh, you know? Do you see a role for you, yourselves uh, in um, you know finding a way through the hype around new new technologies relating to life? Maybe Alan, to hear your thoughts. Well, it's very difficult to predict. Sometimes we mm -hmm. were talking about that as well. Mm -hmm. What is going to turn out to be hype, and which, what's going to turn out to be reality, mm -hmm. and We've had some interesting instances of artists kind of predicting what was going to be possible in areas like um, being able to tell what a person's face looks like through their just their DNA sequence. That's right. Yeah, that's, yeah, that we humble, which is really interesting. Although here is another issue because I think so. So this is a reference to an artist that uh, uh, claimed to be able to isolate some characteristics uh, through DNA that she found on chewing gums and cigarette butts. Uh, she picked off yeah. sa samples yeah. up, up yeah. off the streets of New York yeah. and did some DNA analysis and then printed 3D facial portraits of people she'd never met. And sometimes they were uncannily accurate. I, I would debate that. But you know what's really interesting? That, because what she told me was she was approached by forensic companies and by companies that basically her work was initially a critique or, or a way of questioning this whole notion of genetic surveillance, only becoming this you know, as you mentioned with our work as well, basically promoting the very same thing that she was questioning. Yes. But in a sense, predicting it at the very same time. So, you, you know, which I suppose talks volumes about the, the role that non-agenda-driven, curiosity-based, non-utilitarian research plays and how it can later down the track might be used. But we should allow, and this is something that we're losing in our world, mm -hmm. this notion of non-utilitarian, curiosity-based research, open-ended questions that can be dealt with in, in ways which are not the usual ways that we're now thinking about outcome-based research. Yeah. So. But it, I, it's interesting to me that both of you, I mean, you, you with Genspace in Brooklyn and you, Oren, with uh, Symbiotica and now, now in the RCA, uh, you are both creating uh, these uh, hybrid spaces, if you like, which are non-traditional spaces where you have different tools, you have different actors engaging with these materials. Uh, and um, I suppose, to some extent, you mentioned Science Gallery, which I, I've been involved with in Ireland and elsewhere. Uh, also, this space, which is not, not a traditional space for, for science, for research, but which is involving the public or involving artists and designers. And um, I, I suppose we, we tend to think of sort of uh, new bio, biotech being developed in large industrial labs or large university research labs. But uh, you know, to what extent is that, is that being challenged now with these new types of spaces? Well, at Genspace, we challenge it every day. We, we try to keep our facilities open at a very low price point for people that might have an idea that they want to explore. And we have certain safety considerations as to what level of organism they can work with. So um, we control that. But aside from that, we don't really control anything else. So um, <coughs> we've got people working on industrial projects with organisms that are um, naturally occurring. Uh, we have someone who's trying to turn spent grain from the beer industry into um, animal feed through digestion with a, a microorganism that's naturally occurring. And then we do have people that are trying to make new materials by doing genetic engineering on, um, on, on products of living organisms like bacterial cellulose, for example. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, uh, the, the idea of artists and designers en engaging with these materials, to some people that might appear frightening. I, I remember quite a few years ago, there was a, a very famous incident where Steve Kurtz, the artist, uh, was uh, arrested in his house by the FBI under pr pr prevention of terrorism because he was found with all these biological materials. Uh, uh, and after his wife had a heart attack, it was a, a terrible thing. And it took him quite some time to be, to be released from custody. Um, and it seems that there is a lot of uncertainty and, and fear. I, I, I was recently at the, um, the wonderful ev event, uh, the, um, uh, the, the Jamboree, uh, what's it called in uh, MIT? The, uh, oh, the iGem. iGem Jamboree, absolutely fantastic, where there was uh, many of these, many biohackers are people working with synthetic biology, for example, but 
There was workshops being run by the FBI and the UN weapons inspectors uh, at this event on you know, the safe use of these technologies. Uh, how, how safe is it to allow people just to, to manipulate biological materials in their own homes or using these freely accessible tools? It, it really depends on, on where you draw the boundaries in terms of what organism you're working with because a lot of the safety, uh, the, the things that we've developed as safety protocols at the university level are based on using organisms that are seriously debilitated and if they ever got loose, um, would have an extremely difficult time competing and living yeah. uh, outside the lab. So that's kind of your first safety level. And then, of course, you don't want to use any genetic material from a pathogen. And there, there are guidelines about how much of that material uh, you can work with and what types of organisms' DNA are safe. So. I, I must say, you know, there's quite a difference. And I think bundling what I'm doing, setting up professional labs in art and design schools and uh, biohacking community is not necessarily the same, you know. And, and, and what I'm trying to achieve, and actually with Steve Kurtz, it's a really interesting case. The only place that he could end up working after the whole case was in my lab in Australia because we're so legit that the FBI never talked to me. I was actually quite insulted that they never yeah. invited me to one of their meetings uh, because I'm, a, you know, we, we are legit research lab. Um, and the same way that you wouldn't question what do biolabs have to do with engineering departments, and many of those biolabs that actually I'm going to visit are in engineering departments rather than biology departments, and engineers are known. Actually, there was a paper from Harvard that actually said that engineers are more inclined towards fundamental views. Mm -hmm. uh, my experience with artists was always how responsible they are. And, and even with Steve, the case there was actually what the FBI got him in the end or tried to charge him was for mail and wire fraud because he approached a scientist to order a specifically weakened laboratory strand to work with as opposed to working with the wild type out of concern of safety. And that was then, and because he used the internet and because he used the mail to ship those bacteria from the university uh, where the scientists worked to his university, that was what the FBI was trying to get him because actually he was doing it in a safe way. So I don't think that any artist wants to kill his audience but we know for sure that our governments are paying money to scientists and engineers to do black research that's designed specifically to kill people. I would be more concerned about them. I wouldn't be concerned about artists. Thanks. Um, I'm going to open it up shortly to the audience uh, for a couple of questions. We don't have a huge amount of time, but just one uh, last question for you both, really, before we do that, is that, uh, as was mentioned, we are uh, ideating this new space uh, to explore life sciences here in Munich. Um, and you know, if each of you had maybe one idea for something that we should definitely include in that, what, what would it be? Um, maybe I'll start with you, Ellen, and then Oren. One of the things I find most interesting is somebody who started as a, bun a bench biologist, in other words, working in a wet lab and actually manipulating physical materials like cells and DNA, is that the trend is going towards um, all of this becoming um, hidden behind a computer screen. So there are services and there are companies now. Uh, one of them that comes to mind is Transcriptic in California that will, uh, if you design an experiment, they will perform it for you at their site and then just tell you the answer. So research may be taught to people in the future as something that you design completely in silico and it gets carried out as a fee for service at a remote location. So I think it would be interesting to include in silico design of DNA circuits in the museum with, with the expectation that maybe the next generation is, is not going to be saddled with the sort of bench work that I had to slog my way through. Yeah. Yeah. I, I alluded to it in my talk, you know, there's a, a story by Julian Huxley from 1929, which is called The Tissue Culture King, uh, where this guy ends up in a tribe and transforms the culture into a tissue culture culture, where the religion is basically where they, they grow things of their ancestors and, and the king. Uh, but there's a beautiful sentence there where he says, this is not an Acropolis, but a Histopolis, a place of eternal growth. And, and this idea that the museums really need to move from the notion of them being a place of death to a place of life. And there's so much life out there, either natural or man-made, in a sense, mm. that need to be presented in a living state in a museum. Yeah. Great, wonderful, thank you. Do we, do we have time for one or two quick questions from the floor? Um, we have one here and one here. Yeah. Thank you, 
Oh, no, we, oh that's too bad. Yeah. Okay, we've run out of time. Well, I would. <laughs> okay, thank you, Steffi. <laughs> You're the boss prerogative. <laughs> Thanks, Steffi. I'll try to keep it short. Mm -hmm. uh, looking at what, done, what people have done 20 years ago and what you did, for me as an outsider to that space, it's not really comprehensible why there's no real burger, steak, whatever artificial meat on the market right now, giving the market opportunity. What's, what's holding it back? I think there's a couple of things. First of all, there's still the issue of the fact that we're using quite a lot of animal-derived materials, so cells like to grow in what's called fetal calf serum. 20% of the food for the, the cells, especially when you grow muscles, is still deriving from animals. So you're not solving any problem by that. The second thing is I think there's a, a, a miss conception of those companies in regard to how to sell, and this is going back to my comment about the biologization of industry versus the industrialization, industrialization of uh, uh, biology. Uh, Mark Post, for example, he says that in 20 years' time, you want to be the sole supplier to McDonald's. What I would claim, a smart strategy would be sell it now to Huston Blumenthal, and actually you haven't seen the end of the video there where I, uh, present, I actually presented it to Huston Blumenthal. Do it as a molecular gastronomy. Treat it for what it is now, uh, excessively technological luxury product, and that can be out there in the market tomorrow. But try to sell it as if you're going to solve the problems of the world. No one would buy it and people would spit it out. Yeah. So there's those issues of perception, but also issues of the fact that it is still extremely expensive and Sorry. energy resource. Yeah. Sorry, we're yeah. out of time. Uh, yeah. Do we, yeah. Last question, so very quickly, in, maybe. Yeah, very so. short. In two days, uh, in Paris, the 50 years anniversary will be uh, celebrated of Leonardo, the International si uh, Society for Art, Science and Technology, yeah. right? Which you are presenting in personification in an amazing way. This is a city where the technical university and the art academy are separate. So what do you think is the potential and what would be the place in a place such as Munich where this could be done in an exponential startup kind of way without battling the boundary between these two institutions all the time? I think that's why they got Michael John to come here. <laughs> yeah. he, he's the man. He, speak to him. Let's talk about yeah. it. Yeah. 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 Yeah, no, I think there's a huge opportunity here to break down those boundaries, so I would love to talk further. But I, I hope this has seeded some ideas for all of you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so Thank much you. to you. Ellen Jorgensen from Genspace, Oren Katz, Professor of Contestable Design at the RCA, and thank you to all of you. Thanks. And to Steffi.